We can't talk about quality of life without addressing longevity. While we may be living longer, the question remains, are we living longer in good health? How can science support our goal of maintaining a healthy life throughout our lifespan? Today, I'm joined by Joanna Bench, CEO and co-founder of Longevity Center Europe. We're going to have a fascinating discussion on longevity concept and how it can support our quality of life. How we understand longevity and health is really to look at the physical health, emotional and psychological. When we are looking in the longevity field and also preventive medicine, P4 medicine, we really want to understand the sources of the problem. If we know that Alzheimer's starts 20, 30 years earlier and we can actually find certain markers that can help us. Let's maybe start uh, from the perspective of general trends that are shaping the, the longevity sector nowadays. How we understand longevity and health is really to look at the physical health, emotional and psychological. And I think at the most interesting trends for us as a clinic, uh, it's to bring more and more uh, integration uh, in uh, some of those discoveries uh, together. So as we discussed uh, just before, we are really looking at the um, innovation in the physical um, health from the best uh, solutions in diagnostics, uh, from digital twins so that we can really analyze the existing um, results in diagnostics and correlated in the best uh, and most, more, most efficient way to, you know, microbiome, mitochondria and different aspects of biological aging, epigenetics. This is all that we are already doing. There's more and more biomarkers of aging that are becoming available. Just last week, there was a meeting at the uh, University of Harvard of an organization called um, Biomarkers of Aging Society uh, that um, is presenting the, big, the, the newest discoveries in diagnostics and mm -hmm. uh, biomarkers that are available to measure different aspects of health, from our brain health to our psychological uh, resilience to, uh, to different physical aspects of health to different biological ages. Yeah, well, that's un absolutely unbelievable. And, you know, looking for these interconnections is r really something important. But at the end of the day, it's very far from our current healthcare system where actually exactly. you have the specialization. So exactly. one doctor will only take a look from A to B and then there is another doctor. But to looking for the intersections of those two exactly. can be challenging. And this is the most interesting area for me in, uh, in the field mm -hmm. of longevity. So what is happening in the intersection between the hormonal health, metabolic health, uh, psychology, psychiatry, also neurology. Um, I mean, we don't really, the doctors, when you go to a normal uh, doctor that is uh, focusing on reactive medicine, I mean, we are really, really trained. I mean, the doctors are trained uh, perfectly to react to, to certain problems and to find solutions to, 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 uh, to certain problems. But what we are looking in the longevity field and also preventive medicine, P4 medicine, we really want to understand the sources of the problem and try to eliminate the sources of the problem so that, uh, that we can really impact different aspects of our health and well-being. So health is not only the absence of disease, as we, as we mm -hmm. know, but it's really how we feel, how, we, how much energy we have, how mm -hmm. much, um, you know, whether we, um, uh, we have the right, um, the right mindset as well to, to focus on what is really important in life. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, for me, this is longevity. Yeah, and this is fascinating. And that, that's probably why also, because there are so many different little things that are actually being examined. Uh, there are probably research and development in many different areas, but it's important to put it all together. Yes. And I understand yes. that your initiative for the second time, the Roundtable of Longevity Clinics uh, that is scheduled for December this year, is a platform where you actually gather all the experts from around the world yes, uh, yes to talk <laughs> about all those things and how to connect maybe different type of studies. We have created um, the first um, roundtable of longevity clinics. At the time last year, we um, it was in December, we invited about 10 different clinics from Mayo Clinic to Cleveland Clinic, Fountain Life, um, Biograph, um, My Clinic, Longevity Center, but also a few others so that we can we present at Chi Longevity um, who is doing what in terms of diagnostics, 
biological ages and, uh, and interventions. After the first meeting, we have uh, presented recommendations of what should be the minimum um, diagnostic, uh, set mm -hmm. of diagnostic tools that should be available uh, for the clinic to be called longevity clinic mm -hmm. uh, that is really connected with long life, not short-term diagnostics or because there's many clinics that are doing just preventive medicine or checkups and they're calling it longevity or they're just mm, focusing on microbiome or IVs and they call it longevity. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are certain services that are really contributing, but you really should look at the, the whole um, So you're sometimes losing those aspect. holistic approach. Uh, exactly. You have to really try to look from the holistic point of view. So this year we have already um, many more speakers. We have uh, we have two days conference where we have some of the uh, top um, experts like Peter Diamantis, uh, James Kirkland or Dean Ornish uh, presenting and participating. And also a number of really very interesting roundtable discussions from brain health to different interventions. We have also introduced new areas of longevity, like we were discussing music, but mm -hmm. then music in the context of scientific proof, uh, music, dance, uh, but also spirituality. So I think this is just the beginning because Longevity, uh, International Institute of Longevity wants to be really a platform that is an association for clinics that serve uh, safe medicine and uh, recommend uh, and 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 really a responsible medicine uh, alongside with innovation and uh, all those technologies and recommendations. But um, so because in this sector it was a little bit uh, everyone was doing what they were what they felt it's right. So we need a little bit of um, organization as well, mm -hmm. because longevity medicine is not yet medical school, let's say, medicine, but it's really like integrative medicine or lifestyle medicine. These are uh, certain trends uh, and not yet um, areas of training in the medical school. So I hope this is going to change because people yeah, like... That would be a disruptor Ornish. actually in terms of the way how you treat patients or, you know, and focus on prevention, which I think is absolutely a must if we want to survive. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and Dean Ornish, is, uh, he's uh, considered to be a father of lifestyle medicine and he talks about lifestyle medicine for 30 years. He's going to be presenting very interesting studies that he did in the last um, few years, but published uh, last year, I think about 40 different, 40 patients of, that had early stages of Alzheimer. How after um, certain lifestyle interventions like diet, exercise, meditation, and breathing exercises, they were able to reverse some of those symptoms of Alzheimer, which is for me, amazingly mm -hmm. uh, disruptive because today we have very few recommendations that can uh, all treatments for Alzheimer that uh, that we can use but if we know that Alzheimer starts 20 30 years earlier and we can actually find certain markers that can help us to uh, to, to to better understand it and influence the outcome and uh, or postpone the, the, the onset of those conditions then I think this is very very disruptive. It is, especially looking at the statistics, even in Europe itself. I think every fifth uh, person uh, after uh, uh, around 60 is potentially a person that might have know, the dementia or some memory yeah. problems, right? So, yeah, but you know, there's certain areas that are really simple, like diet, and we know what is definitely contributing to uh, Alzheimer's and uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And we know it's, for example, sugar, the diet that we, uh, that we choose. And we know it's uh, it's contributing. So I think this one is a no-brainer, but it's still uh, not popular. St <laughs> it's still not popular. You know, we, we still eat sugar. We still eat very inflammatory diet. And I think there's certain areas that should be already taught at school as well and be just you know best practice because our doctors are of course looking into that and giving those recommendations. But for many people, this is so simple that it's just. It's just too simple, mm -hmm. uh, but it's this one is really medically validated mm -hmm. and scientifically validated uh, aspect that uh, that uh, 
it should be a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah, well, we once had this discussion in one of the previous episodes, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually most of the things that can have a really major impact on your health are, are, are for free, like sleep, like, yeah. you know, selecting actually good yeah. things to eat, you know, exercising, even walking 30 or 40 Making minutes the right a day, choices. right? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so it's more about choices. habits. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but, you know, probably one challenge is, you know, how to transfer this scientific knowledge to the broader society. And second is how to make those people, even with the knowledge, <laughs> exactly. to, to, to make This is one it. of the areas we are going to also discuss. Uh, the client, how to keep the client motivated and mm -hmm. how to keep the client engaged. If we make it easy and accessible, mm -hmm. then it's much easier for us to have these healthy choices. But if we are surrounded by uh, by fast food uh, solutions and, you know, being very far from places that you can go out, and like US, I mean, you don't mm -hmm. have many places in bigger cities even to walk. Um, mm -hmm. because everyone is driving from A to B in the car. So uh, in some of the cities, they don't even have pavements that you can actually walk from A mm -hmm. to B. So this is some of the areas that are now discussed between um, the doctors, the longevity clinics, but also companies that are uh, responsible for infrastructure, for hotels, for, for yeah, all this real estate city market, design. You know, how you design your estates. I mean, exactly. that's, uh, you know, that opens my mind now. <laughs> and I, in terms of so what that you, can. you can actually design the city, design the um, the work environment so that you create those healthy choices uh, easier available. And then, and then yeah, you can you expect bump on people them. to. Exactly. <laughs> and then you, you, you. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, actually, Angle. I, I was not thinking about it this way, but of course you have this even the concept of uh, city of longevity uh, created by this UK Institute for uh, Innovation Institute for Aging. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are also testing it. And, you know, this, these assumptions, benches where you can sit, uh, pavements where you can walk, you know. Uh, so all those concepts like 50 15 minute cities, 10 minute cities, it's yes. all around moving. Yes. Uh but it's the same walking. Dan Butner, mm -hmm. I think, did a, a number of projects in the US. I think one it was in Fort Ward and a few others, on actually creating um, maybe not even the whole city, but even just one district mm -hmm. that would be actually uh, offering some of those healthy choices to the general public and uh, create more spaces where we can actually, that people can meet and multi-generations can actually meet together and, and, um, and, and have certain um, joint activities. Yeah, yeah uh, because it's a really interesting discussion on the services, what type of services you can bring into such an area, so yeah, you know, yeah. that actually serve the whole society at the end. Exactly. So, and they had really quite uh, quite interesting results. The most uh, difficult was really to keep it keep the people motivated. But mm -hmm. I think some of the results from this uh, research on um, on this um, kind of mini blue zones in the US mm -hmm. were really uh, very very inspiring. So. Mm -hmm. I really only wish that we could do something like this in Warsaw. Mm -hmm. uh, although in comparison to some of the US cities, I still think that Poland and we are also in Zurich, our second uh, center is in Zurich. Um, in Europe, uh, we have many more opportunities to actually mm -hmm. make these healthy choices. And okay. I have to say that in Warsaw, we have more um, uh, good quality restaurants that serve good quality of food and vegan restaurants than anywhere in uh, in in the US that I've been. Well, that, that that's really interesting. And this conference, this roundtable you organize, it's more for the scientific, for the doctors, or it's broader? No, it's it's actually for clinics, for doctors, but it's also we we, we have quite schools, a number of people mm -hmm. that are coming just from the business uh, okay. world. And uh, so we have it on the 6th and 7th of December uh, in California, in Novato at the Bach Institute. Um, this year we will have 250 people. We already have plans to do one in Europe. There's going to be either Zurich or London. We're just uh, finalizing uh, the decision whether we do one or two mm -hmm. and one in Middle East, because mm -hmm. this is something that is really the the idea of clinics as, uh, and, and actually collaboration between uh, longevity clinics is uh, it's growing and mm -hmm. there's more clinics being open in Middle East, in Asia, uh, but also in Europe. And uh, we are also looking between different international clinics how to collaborate more so that we can refer uh, certain clients to each other as well mm -hmm. and learn from each other. because. Um, in some of those clinics, we are using the same biomarkers and the same, uh, giving very similar recommendations. So 
there's definitely we are looking for ways where we can uh, do joint research mm-hmm. um, yeah, everything for the benefit data. of yeah <laughs> of our clients. And is it also the topic that uh, attracts investors? Because I imagine that also to do it Very right, much. you need quite mm-hmm. uh, it's quite capital intensive. I would imagine, especially this R and D part. We are looking at also bringing together different technologies that were maybe not produced for longevity, but they contribute to certain. Mm-hmm elements of uh, of what we do as part of the recommendations on so rapidly growing market definitely. very rapidly growing market this is why for me this this is what attracts investors that there are so many uh, areas that uh, we actually bring together and um, and it's it's really a platform for many different uh, companies to mm-hmm. come together not to mention functional food healthy life choices healthy food or supplements so these are all areas that uh, you know that attract investment and some of them are you know maybe faster growing and some of them are more uh, less mature um, there are many new ways how to do diagnostics. Um, you know, we, we started with MRI, with this very expensive solutions, but now there's many more solution providers that are giving us different ways how to scan the body, uh, for example, to help with a diagnosis of um, of um, um, can- cancer, uh, breast cancer, for example. Great, mm-hmm. great. Well, so maybe the, the last question, you know, looking forward, how do you see the role of the clinics in general? Yes, because well, I understand that, yeah. you know, that on one hand you are doing uh, behind the doors very, you know, scientific research and development work on that. And then on the other hand, your mission is a little bit also to spread it around and make yes. it to actually use the prevention in the best possible way, not really that it's very costly, you know. So how would you see the role of the this would be forward. very important because uh, this is what we also want to do in the International Institute of Longevity to really see how, because some of the clinics will always be for the kind of selected group and most of us, uh, most of the clinics that are entering the sector wants to really create more and more um, solutions that can be used by general public and at home. Um, if you look at the holistic health, I mean, you have to do a number of different tests to, to really understand your, uh, your, um, where you are. But there's more and more solutions that would be available that will give us at least this kind of, uh, the screening process uh, would be uh, faster and also cheaper. So we are looking for biomarkers that uh, we can introduce that uh, that can be the, you know, kind of the, the, the most interesting first step of screening. And um, so I believe definitely we will see more collaboration. We will see more training because we are also, um, together with other clinics, we are introducing a longevity academy. We want to train also doctors. We want to train uh, specialists that are interested in this field, in nutrition, in movement, in sport, that um, to equip them with the right uh, knowledge mm-hmm. so that we can that we can see actually more longevity um, validated longevity solutions also outside of clinics. Mm-hmm. Um, so the clinics hopefully will be kind of a nucleus that is going to create the network of other solution providers that can help us to make the right choices. Okay, so good luck with the conference and I'll be waiting for the, at least an article after the conference, w- you. what, you, what you've mm-hmm. discussed, what are the standards and what we should all follow to make our lives better and Thank healthier. you very much, Sylvia. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. It was great having you here.